So it probably makes sense to talk about what we've done so far and what we need to do in this part and then in part three. So if you recall back in part one, watch it. If you haven't, we made the 3D environment for this corridor. It's photorealistic and we can move our camera through it, which is kind of a cool thing. But that means in this part, we need to focus on the object, the thing that we're focusing on, which of course is gonna be the animated slinky moving down the corridor. So we're gonna be talking about how to do this whole procedural slinky thing in the animation. And if you haven't seen the CG matter wonder quickie about how to make a procedural slinky, maybe watch it, it'd be helpful. I don't wanna explain the same thing to you again and again and again, you're not a baby. Do the homework and then you'll be prepared for this. Of course, you can watch this blindly and I'll try to make it make sense, but the quickie will help. Anyways, once we get to part three, we're then gonna take our slinky, we're gonna take our 3D environment and combine everything together into the final shot using some compositing, some volumetrics, etc. So part two of the tutorial series, doing the animation and the slinky, I think we're ready to begin. So where did we leave off? Well, last time we have our blend file, or we had our blend file, that's the correct way to say it. Uh, we had our blend file with the 3D scenery that we made. Recall, we just had some very, very simple geometry. It kind of looks like this. I mean, it, <laughs> it exactly looks like that. And we used our camera as the projector to actually have photorealistic textures. We also said that if we have two cameras, one's the projector and one is the viewer, uh, we can have the viewer be independent of this and be able to see this from different angles. Whereas the projector, uh, the one doing the texturing, that's the one we don't want to move or else weird stuff will happen, okay? So that's just where we left off. Don't worry about all that. I want you to take it and just throw it away. It's nonsense, forget it. Because now we're just focused on the animation and it's in some sense independent from this. In fact, we can kind of do everything from the side view as if this wasn't here or even better, we could hide. And let's actually do that. Let's hide everything, okay? So to make the slinky, we're gonna follow the same procedure as the Blender Quickie. And to do that, you're gonna need two add-ons. The first one, let me get this on the main screen. The first one is gonna be something called extra objects, the curves. So it's gonna give us extra curves, which is gonna be useful for spirals and bendy arcs and all that. The second one is gonna be called animal and it's gonna let us animate these curves. If you do not have these add-ons enabled, you're doing it wrong, just enable the add-ons. That's what you're gonna wanna do. Okay, so you're gonna go to edit, preferences, add-ons, make sure you have extra objects. That's this one, the curve version enabled, the mesh version isn't relevant to us, and animal. These both come with the, um with Blender, just make sure you have community enabled if you don't see it. Once you have these add-ons enabled, you're gonna see when we go to curve, we're gonna have some extra stuff, actually a whole bunch of it, um, including curve spirals Archimedean. This is a kind of spiral that uh, kind of grows in height linearly. It doesn't do any weird logarithmic spin or anything like that. It's a linear Archimedean curve. If you know math, you'll know what that means. If you don't, doesn't matter, okay? So we're gonna give this thing a bit of height so it actually looks like a spiral. <laughs> you know, it, it's not like a effect effectively a circle, but a spiral. And you're gonna notice that right now this is kind of overextending from the z-axis. Uh, this is gonna happen for some step values because the add-on wasn't programmed correctly. Uh, for other step values, you're gonna notice that it goes exactly to the z-axis. We want a step value, in other words, a subdivision level with a lot of detail, but also that goes to the z-axis. So it starts and terminates at the same x uh, distance, right? So I'm gonna kind of scroll up. I think something like 50 uh, is both a large number and satisfies this condition. So I'm gonna go with 50, you could do 100, it doesn't matter. Cool, so we've made our Archimedean spiral. Of course, this is useful. No, it's useless, that's what I meant. It's useless to us as a curve object. We want this to be a mesh. And how do we turn this into a mesh? Well, you just run the convert to operation and we wanna convert mesh from a curve you know, metaball, surface, text, whatever. So in other words, curve turns into a uh, mesh, okay? So now when we go into edit mode, this is gonna be like a normal mesh that you're used to. Of course, it's only gonna have vertices. And if we want this to be kind of like a strip, a something with the area, a surface area, all we're gonna have to do is select everything, E for extrude, and then we're gonna scale inwards. So something like that. And you don't want this to be too big. It's kind of the thickness of your slinky. So something like that gives us a nice uh, looking thing. It has faces, it has a uh, surface area. And in fact, let's actually go to solid view so it doesn't look weird. Okay, so this is almost a slinky except what is a slinky? It's just this a bunch of time stacked vertically. So how do we automate this process instead of copying and pasting over and over again? Well, what we can do is you go to the modifiers, you add in an array modifier, which does exactly what we want it to. Of course, we don't want this to be copies horizontally on the x-axis, but instead, 
we want it to go relatively one unit, one full object up on the z-axis. You can control how many of these you want, in other words, the length of your slinky. Uh, but you're going to notice that because of the Archimedean spiral thing, and this is just kind of the normal of the original curve, it's not going to really match from beginning to end. The curvature is a bit off. So I'm just going to do a bit of a hack. I'm going to merge by distance. And if you make this distance value big enough, I'm just making it a bit bigger, um, it's going to merge the previous and the next iteration. You can make this a lot bigger to have kind of like a larger thing going on, but I wouldn't get too extreme. So maybe something like this is fine. You just want it to be quad-based uh, topology, geometry, I don't know. Okay, cool. Um, you're gonna notice that this slinky is very sparse, meaning that it's not very compressed. Uh, we can change that very easily by looking at our source mesh. I'm gonna use the 3D cursor as our pivot and we can scale on the Z axis uh, to basically make this thing thinner and then it's getting copied, which gives it the illusion of uh, compression, right? So something like that should be fine, and we can always edit this later, it's completely procedural. I'm thinking that something like that is fine. If we want this thing to have thickness, because right now it's a infinitely thin spiral sheet, the way we did that in the Blender Quickie is you add in a solidify modifier, which is just gonna extrude everything nicely. And a nice trick is if this kind of looks faceted to you, it looks very flat shaded, you're gonna enable shade smooth. This is gonna make it look smooth, but in fact, a little too smooth. And to fix that, you're just gonna go to normals and enable auto smooth, which is only gonna do smoothing if the angle is under this. Uh, normally you call this thing a fong angle. That's just some history that you didn't need to know. Okay, so now we have this procedural thing where we can change kind of the compression of this, the thickness of it with the solidify modifier, as well as if we select the interior vertices, kind of like the this kind of radius, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so now let's do a bit more with it. So uh, obviously we don't want this to be vertical. We want it to be going along an arc that we animate. And this is kind of a important point. I'm going to be doing this different from the Blender Quickie where we use the bend to four modifier to get these perfect arcs. It's a useful method, but if you want to do more than one bounce, it gets complicated for reasons that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but instead, we're just going to create a Bezier curve that kind of looks like an arc that we're just going to animate uh, going further and further down the corridor. That's the idea. Okay, so how do we do this? We're going to add in a, so shift A, we're going to add in a Bezier curve. We're going to rotate it on the X axis so it's facing us. Let's make that a lot bigger in edit mode. So we want this to be an arc because that is what slinkies hop in. They hop in uh, arcs or semicircles, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to rotate this along its own pivot point so that it's vertical. This one should be easy because it's a rotation by 90 degrees. And this already gives us a arc. Uh, we can make this look better by, first of all, scaling this to the same size as the other one. So this way it's not lopsided. We can also... Uh, scale these together, something like uh, moving on the x-axis like that. Of course, this thing is very low resolution, and because it's a curve object, it's not like we subdivide it really. I mean, you could, uh, but to make it look more detailed, you just take the resolution preview and make that a lot larger, so like that. And this makes it look a lot smoother. You can actually crank this up uh, quite a bit, so let's keep it with 50. And then finally, the question is, how do we get our spring or I guess it's a spring right now, it will become a slinky in a bit. How do we get this on here? Very simple, you just add another modifier to the stack. So now we're adding in a curve modifier, meaning take our mesh and move it along the curve. And we're gonna select our Bezier on the Z. I think it's Z, or maybe it's Y, I guess it's Y. It depends what orientation you make this in. If you rotated the whole coordinate system 90 degrees, uh, I guess it would have been X or Z or something. Okay, so this raises a interesting point. You're gonna notice that this part of the slinky is very thick as compared to this thin part. And that's because the curve modifier is kind of deforming our geometry. That's exactly what it's doing, but it's not doing it uniformly, meaning that the metal's kind of getting pinched in some points, and this is where modifier stack, your, your modifier, nah, your modifier order matters. So if you have one modifier and then another, that might be different than if you reverse them. So if we were to take this curve and put it above above the solidify modifier, that solves the problem because first, first it's gonna you know deform this uh, infinite sh infinitely thin sheet. I can't talk today to our curve. It's first gonna do that, and then it's gonna solidify. So in this case, that's what you want. We can also take our ray modifier and bump this up so it's kind of a full slinky. 
And I know what you're thinking. Why don't we do this kind of like fit curve thing with our Bezier? This way it gives us exactly the right thing. That's because if we animate this, it's going to give us extra links that we don't want. We want it to have a constant amount of material. Um, so I recommend using a fixed count and then just picking a number that works for you. Um, but uh, currently, since this thing is procedural, we can fix our slinky because it kind of looks off in a couple different ways. Uh, first of all, I think it should be thinner. So I'm just going to scale it like this. Second of all, I imagine it should be denser. So again, you select the faces, 3D cursor, 3D cursor and scale on the Z axis for that kind of compression. So something like that. And you're going to notice that if you do it too much, your geometry is going to break. And that's because of this merge. Uh, so I'm just going to bring that distance down until it's fixed. And now we have a better looking situation. I'm thinking we need to add many more. Hmm. You know what? We can make it even thinner. So like that. Fix the merge. And you're just going to have to keep doing this if you don't want to do the uh, fit curve method, which I don't. So there you go. Now we have a nice thick slinky and I'm just gonna give it the correct uh, count. Doesn't need to be perfect. So it kind of looks like it's sitting on the floor here and here uh, is all we can really ask for. Okay, so now we have a nice procedural setup that lets us move this without adding extra links. Uh, we can also change other parameters, of course, like the uh, thickness and all that, as we already talked about. And we might go back to that later. Uh, but now what we are interested in is how do we not, like, you know, we can animate this curve and have the arc go from place to place to place. Uh, but what makes a slinky, what makes a slinky look like a slinky is that it compresses in some areas. Like there's a, a bunch of links in one area and sparser amounts in other areas, and then it reverses. So that compression and stretch, how do we get that? Uh, well, if you already saw the thing, you already know it's a lattice modifier is what we're going to be doing. Okay, so how do we do that? This is kind of a underused, underutilized modifier in my experience. Uh, what we're going to do is let's hide some of these. So it just looks like a vertical situation. I'm going to add in a lattice object. This doesn't work. I mean, you can convert something into a lattice, but I would recommend starting off with a lattice object. Basically, this is going to be a domain of where it's going to be affected. So we want to make sure that it's covering that it's covering our slinky in full. So I'm just having the top be at the top of the slinky and the bottom be at the bottom. We can also scale this on the X axis so that we don't get that extra stuff going on over here and then in the lattice properties just add some uh, vertical some z-axis i guess they call w here divisions i like five and basically we're going to make a controller here 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 and basically at every height level to say we want this much compression in this area that much in that area etc if this doesn't make sense just wait a minute it will be clarified in a moment you're going to go to edit mode and we're, we're going to need controllers so that we don't animate this manually to do this control h to hook a new object this is going to give us an empty that lets us control those vertices whatever was selected i'm going to select the next uh, grouping and we're going to do control h next grouping control h Next group in control H and you only have to do this five times more if you have uh, more than five uh, levels. So now we have a lattice modifier that we can control each level with its respective empty. And to make this actually affect stuff, we're going to have to add in a lattice modifier to our slinky modifier stack. And we're, we are going to select our lattice. Of course, we want this to happen before the curvature happens. So we want this uh, strip that the array modifier makes a vertical stack. We then use the lattice modifier to compress and stretch. Then we curve, then we solidify. So I'm gonna bring this up above the curve. And you're gonna notice that now this actually affects our slinky. It kind of looks weird um, unless we only do our uh, motion on the Z axis. And you can see how this compresses it um, in this area. So now we have a lot of links here and fewer over there. Uh, which, again, works with our modifier stack if we were to enable these. It still has that curvature, but now you can see everything's compressed in the beginning. So that is the idea. So let's just reset those. Okay, cool. So now I'm going to just apply all our, or not apply, I'm going to have all our modifiers be seen. So we can see what's going on here. Again, a intuitive way to see this is now that we have everything showing, we can affect compression on this curve thing that still follows this path. It's a nice little uh, situation we have going on here. Um, okay, so long story short, we have everything needed to animate our situation. So now let's do our animation and then we're gonna put it in our corridor. And that will be a nice uh, wrap up for this tutorial. 
So the way Slinky works um, basically is it starts on one end. I guess I should have this be the main camera. It starts on one end, it's compressed, so it has a lot of energy, a lot of elastic energy, or spring energy, whatever you wanna call it. It then bounces in the arc and then it compresses here and then again and again and again. So there's this compression to uniform to compression kind of arc uh, that happens again and again and again. So how do we do that? Well, let's switch to the Blender view. Uh, to animate our compression, we have to effectively animate our lattice, which means we need to animate our uh, empties that control everything. In fact, we can hide the lattice. We don't need to see it, okay? Um, okay, so why is this off camera? This is weird. I wanna be able to see our keyframes. Okay, so let's move that over. Okay, so on, let's say, okay, so at this point we wanna say how long does each bounce take. I'm gonna say each one's gonna take 30 frames at 30 frames per second, so each one's gonna take a second, meaning on frame one, everything should be compressed to the left. On frame 15, we have essentially what we see here, and on frame 30, the bounce is complete. In other words, frame 15, we can select all our empties that have to do with the slattice and put in a location keyframe. On frame one, we want everything to be compressed one way um, so that it's compressed on this side, which I think uh, means we want to scale these towards the uh, bottom one. So let's go to 3D cursor because right now the 3D cursor is on the bottom and we can scale these on the Z axis. Oh, I guess it's exactly the opposite. Although if we look at it from the other way now, whoops, if we look at it from the other way, now it becomes, if I can actually hit this button, now it becomes correct. So let's actually uh, do it that way. I'm gonna scale these on the Z axis by something like, I don't know, 0.15. So these are all very close together. And we also want to move these a bit up because our lattice modifier wasn't perfect. So something like that, we're gonna add in a keyframe. So again, we're even though we changed the scale, all we really care about is the three dimensional coordinate of this empty, in other words, its location. Uh, so that's why we do a location keyframe instead of a scale uh, keyframe. And now you can see we go from compressed to perfect dark and then on frame 30, uh, where it's gonna end our bounce and prepare for the next one, I'm going to select the top one, Shift S, to move the uh, cursor there, so that's Shift S. And now we are gonna select everything and this time scale upwards, because that's where the Z, um, no, that's where the 3D cursor is. We're gonna scale by the same amount, 0.15, like that, and then we're gonna need to move these up or down, something like that, until it looks like it's resting on the ground location keyframe. So long story short, we get something like this. So compression, yeah, compression, stretch, and then compression. And if we wanna do more bounces, we just need to have this go back and forth, back and forth. Of course, it's not gonna make much sense of you know the spring going you know back the other way, but we're gonna animate the uh, Bezier curve to have it make sense. Uh, so now we just reverse this process. So 15 frames later, another half bounce later, we duplicate our center keyframe. On frame 60, we go back to our initial condition. So now it's gonna go forwards and backwards. And then we just kind of copy that over and over again. So now we can duplicate a larger portion of these, which should start on frame 75. Nice. And here's what we have so far. So this is just animating our lattice setup, but we haven't yet uh, made it to the curve modifier. Not really. And by the way, just so you really, really understand what's going on here, if we were to not visualize the rest of these, we just have this kind of vertical uh, compression going on, which we then uh, say, make it go to our curve, and then we give it thickness, which is why the whole kind of setup works. Okay, so now we have this. Let's have it end on frame, well, it goes to 120, so let's have it go to frame 120 uh, so, the, so that we don't have to animate this forever. Uh, basically, the rest of this is just animating this arc so that after this, the arc then goes over here. So the bounce keeps going in the same direction instead of backwards. Now, this is where it gets a bit janky half the time. Uh, you're going to see what I mean in a second. But uh, what you're going to need to do is this is where we're going to start using the animal add-on, which is going to let us animate the actual path of this curve. So what I'm gonna do is this is fine, this arc is fine until we're getting ready for our second bounce, uh, which starts on frame 30. So four frames behind again, if frame 30 is where the bounce is, I'm gonna go four backwards to 26. I'm gonna select all these vertices and if we enable points, we can add in a keyframe. We can go four frames forwards after the bounce and then let's say we want uh, this arc to be over here. So you can see now the bounce would happen, uh, you know, it keeps going forward. Uh, the way we can do this perfectly is uh, you select this area, Shift S, cursor to selected, so this is our pivot point. 
And now you scale this on the x-axis by negative one, which is gonna flip it, it's gonna mirror it to the other side. And then we select everything, point selected, insert. So here's what it looks like. So you can see it kind of does what we want. Of course, it does this weird kind of dipping thing, and this is this kind of preservation of length thing going on. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a bummer uh, that this happens. It won't happen when we do it the next time because of the orientation of the path, it's weird. Uh, but for this bounce, we're just gonna need to do a bit of patchwork. So we always want this to look like it's resting. I guess the final one goes to this line a bit under the ground. If we just remember that, we can fix this up easily. So on frame 30, we just bring this up vertically until it's kind of like there. We add in a keyframe, and then we're just gonna need to keep going uh, in between. So frame 28, we bring it down to about here, keyframe 27, it already looks just about right, keyframe, and now it's moved forwards. And basically these keyframes are just to patch up the uh, nonsense. I'm sure there is a way to avoid this maybe with shape, uh, keyframes instead of something like point keyframes. You could experiment with that. I'm not going to because this is the method that I used and it works fine. And in fact, uh, no matter what you do, there's gonna be a bit of jankiness to this unless you do it perfectly. But the jankiness almost makes it look like there's more energy being uh, stored up so it actually kind of works for you. So here's what we have so far. So we have this weird thing going up and down, up and down, up and down, uh, but effectively makes our mesh look like it's stationary for that area. So let's see what that looks like. So you can see what I mean, it's kind of janky, but it gives us gives it a nice energy that I like. <laughs> and then if we don't uh, modify it, it's gonna start going backwards. So as I told you for this part, it's gonna be much easier. So our next bounce is on frame 60, cause it happens every 30 frames. We're gonna go four frames back to 56, keyframe. And now for 64, we do exactly what you'd expect. Cursor, that's a shift S, scale this on the X axis by negative one, keyframe, uh, but this time it should work perfectly. So for some reason, something about path orientation or whatever, I don't know. But now we should have one more bounce starting on frame 90. So this one's another manual uh, boy, but now that you know how to do this, it should be pretty quick. So I'm gonna keep this on camera because it really doesn't take that long. Insert a keyframe, 94, pivot point, scale this to negative one on the X axis, keyframe, and now we do our adjustment where again, the goal is to have this look like normally be on the floor, but for us, it's a bit under, it seems. And depending on how long you want this transition to be, for me, it's eight frames, because I'm going four uh, backwards and four forwards. Um, depending on how many keyframes you have, this adjustment could take much longer, uh, but I don't see why you would have it take uh, more than however many keyframes. So let's just do that. You're gonna notice a bit of a change in orientation, which is weird, has to do with this path thing, but do not worry about it because we're gonna make this thing metallic. Uh, so you're not even gonna be able to notice and it's gonna be moving so fast. No one's gonna see a thing. Okay, so let's see this. Second bounce, perfect. And you just kind of keep doing this process. Of course, you could do some delta uh, shifting keyframes and stuff to not make you copy the work. Uh, but that we now have an animation that looks pretty cool. So some bounces, like the ones that we patch up, are gonna have like this kind of weird uh, springy thing to it, and other ones are gonna be nice and smooth, which will add a bit of variation. And of course, you don't have to have every bounce take 30 frames. You could have a tiny bit of variation. The arc could get smaller, uh, whatever you want. It could even change direction. Uh, but now that we have this whole thing animated, uh, it's pretty much ready to just be inserted into our scene. So I'm gonna hit Alt-H to reveal everything else. And now basically the idea is how do we move everything we've done basically into the corridor. To do this, uh, you don't wanna necessarily move the slinky itself or weird stuff is gonna start happening. Uh, as you can see, that's not what you wanna do. Instead, what we're gonna do, <laughs> what we're gonna, our method of, our plan of action is gonna be to uh, create an empty, I'm gonna be using one with a sphere on it just so it's very distinct. In fact, let's move our cursor shift S to the world origin so it's gonna be there. And let's add in our empty. I'm gonna call this our, sp uh, not spring, but slinky empty. And we're gonna parent everything in our rig. So the lattice, the uh, empties that control the lattice, the mesh, the curve, um, all these things we're gonna parent to it and then we're gonna be able to move it around. So make sure you have everything. So in other words, we're gonna need our five empties. We're gonna need our curve, our Bezier curve that we're animating. We're gonna need our lattice. So I'm just control clicking here. 
We're gonna need the actual mesh being the uh, spiral. And what else? I think that is everything. If not, we'll just go back and add it. Uh, once you have all these things selected, make sure the final thing you select is the slinky empty so that this is the active object. That's why it's yellow, not orange. Control P, parent to object. Okay, so let's see if we did this right. We might've forgotten something. Looks correct. So now when we move this empty, it moves the whole setup. So in fact, we could just like move this somewhere random and it's still gonna do our animation as if we move the uh, ground plane. Okay, so long story short, uh, we now wanna rotate this so it's going down the hallway, so 90 degrees. So that's the cool thing. Once we have our animation, we can just kind of shift it wherever. We can also scale it, uh, which is useful if our slinky is too big. So I'm trying to think, a normal slinky is kind of larger than you'd think, not that big compared to a corridor. In fact, maybe it's a bit smaller. And you just wanna make sure that this is resting on the ground. Okay, that looks good. And now it's just moving down the corridor. Very simple, you can have it start further back or more forwards or whatever. Here's what it looks like from our original projector view. And it looks like it's actually moving down the uh, corridor because it is, but also we have the correct camera calibration and everything. So I'm gonna have it start a bit further back. We can always decide and change this later. And again, because this whole setup was procedural, we can do some like art direction, some last minute tweaks. And you know, that's kind of the nice thing. Uh, we can select our spiral mesh, which has all the modifiers. And at any point we can change the thickness or whatever. So now it's nice and thick and it's still doing the same kind of thing. Um, but we could do anything like that. And I'm trying to think, what about this doesn't look good? Might look fine. I'm thinking that maybe it could be a bit thinner. So I'm gonna go into edit mode and Let's make sure we can actually see our faces. We want this to be a tiny bit thinner, which means I'm gonna select the interior uh, points. Uh, let's uh, do a median point so it scales from the center. I'm gonna make this a tiny bit thinner, uh, which again is gonna make our slinky thinner. So I'm gonna make it a tiny bit thinner, something like that. Uh, you can decide what kind of slinky you want for your project. But let's see this. Nice. And of course you could always add in more uh, links by making your array modifier a bit bigger, but then you need to compress it. Uh, you know the drill at this point. Now let's select our viewer camera, which is the one we're seeing and just kind of reposition it. Uh, so we're seeing this from a new uh, angle, some like low down uh, angle that we wouldn't be able to capture with a normal camera. And in fact, we can uh, do that viewport trick, the passer part out, however you pronounce it. You bump that, it's not gonna show all the excess stuff. And look at that, we have a, a slinky moving. In fact, we could even put in a basic camera animation, so location, rotation, scale. Uh, for our camera on frame one, we're going to 120 where it's further down, so let's have our camera chase it a little. Maybe it's gonna go on the other side of this arc, kind of like sweeping um, across the invisible path. And then of course we want to reorient this so that it's looking at our slinky. And let's move it a bit further to the side we can always play with this later. Uh, but now we have our camera kind of chasing the slinky. In this interesting way, maybe we'll do a linear interpolation. Uh, this is something we can always fix later. And as for making it look realistic, ambient inclusion and all this with Eevee, we're also gonna talk about that later. But for now, if you just switch to cycles, you're gonna get a much more you know, <laughs> photorealistic looking thing because we're actually getting uh, ray tracing and lighting interactions and all this. So I believe that is everything I had planned for this tutorial. So we made the slinky, we made the, in fact, we made the uh, procedural slinky. Uh, we animated the bad boy, we placed it in our shots. And now for part three, which is gonna be the next one, we're gonna be talking about materials, integrating everything together and basically getting this from a bunch of assets, which is what it is to something you can render and be proud of and put on your fridge and show your mom and she'll be proud of you. Um, long story short, Patreon, Patreon, we're at the end of the video, so let me pimp this out a bit. Um, if you liked this free tutorial, this free tutorial series that you're watching right now, uh, consider uh, being a patron over at the Patreon. So you can do that if you just wanna support this channel and keep me making these tutorials uh, for free, available for free, this is why it's possible. Thank you, 420 patrons-ish. 
uh, active patrons so far. I really appreciate your help. But uh, viewers right now who want to be patrons, you can join this. Um, on top of that, uh, you're like, oh, what do I get out of it beyond helping out this channel on CG Matter channel? Uh, you're also going to get access to exclusive tutorials that I do not post for free. Uh, those are Patreon-only tutorials. Uh, you're also going to get access to blend files. For example, the final scene of what we're working on here, that is going to be a blend file. You're going to get uh, the one I used for the actual shot that I used. Uh, you also get behind the scenes access, Discord access, etc. So it really is a cool thing. You can pick whatever tier you want, but I really do appreciate for whatever reason that you may want to become a patron. If you do, uh, thank you. It is what keeps this channel sustained reliably. And I try to keep these advertisements at the end so it doesn't feel forced. And I feel like somebody would be more willing to do that once they've seen a long tutorial and gained knowledge, whatever. Anyways, I, ow, <laughs> I hit my foot with the headphones. That's my... Cute to leave. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope you learned something. Join me for part three where we are going to finish this fucking mess. Goodbye.